Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Sean Murphy says he's found the secret sauce for success. Let's find out more from Sean today. Sean, thanks for being with us. Hello. Now, you tell us that there's a surprising secret in all of us. What is it? Yeah, so in the context of work, I think what we tend to, what we seemingly have forgotten is that those who are doing the work are human beings. And as human beings showing up every single day, we bring with us our human needs and wants and desires. And, well, they tend to be overlooked because it's like, well, you're here to get, you know, do a job and collect a paycheck. But if we have companies and leaders who want to actually create a positive work experience and want teams to excel and, and, and actually exceed expectations, one of those human needs, and that's the surprise, is this, this need to belong and how companies can actually tap into it in a relatively cost-free way. And that's actually surprising. It's our human nature, our human need to belong that I, we learned – uh, is the surprise to these teams that we studied in terms of their high performance. And you say belonging is an outcome. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, unlike in many things in business, you can't just force something to happen, right? You can you can apply a deadline to a product launch. You could say, hey, we're going to go into these new markets by this date. But you can't say, all right, on Friday, you know, the uh, next Friday, everybody's going to feel this sense of belonging. It actually comes from intentional actions from leaders and the organization that lead employees to get to this place where they feel valued, wanted, and welcome, which is the definition of belonging. <laughs> now, I'm sure some of our listeners are saying, oh, this is that soft stuff again. That doesn't apply. <laughs> this is kind of be nice to everybody and don't trip uh, Jack when he's walking past the desk. But you actually <laughs> say that companies like LinkedIn and Airbnb, they actually have senior leaders responsible for this. That, that's a position in those companies. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So here's the here's an interesting um, bit of research that is not part of the research that I did for Work Tribes, is when when big company big consulting research companies like Deloitte and McKinsey look at what's going on in the workplace. One of the trends that has started to surface over the past five years for those, and I'm sharing this for those who might be the naysayers around this soft stuff, is that organizations are starting to realize they underinvested in their leadership development in the soft skills area, that soft stuff, and overdeveloped in the professional skill sets. And now as we find uh, working is more collaborative in nature and collaboration requires us to work alongside people more often, if we're going to have successful collaborations, have successful business outcomes, we need people to know how to tap into those soft skills. So the soft skills has actually become a really important focus for a lot of executives who are looking at the workforce going, uh-oh, we don't quite have the the skill sets that we need for people to really know how to navigate differences and how to create a positive experience when they're on the team. So it really is truly Yes, it's a soft thing, but as I say in the book, the soft things are the hardest things. <laughs> and you're going to help us get the, through those hard things today. <laughs> Let's now, hope so. <laughs> now, you mentioned another word, though. You say belonging has to yeah. do with university, and it almost seems like that's a misstatement, so I had to read my own notes a few times. What does that mean when we say belonging has to do with university? Well, it's something that we all want, right? You know, it's 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 a human desire to know that what we are doing is uh, is is or knowing that we have people that we can turn to to work alongside them to develop friendships to actually you know go through the struggles in life and when we can believe that this is something that we get to experience at work it just taps into that universal need for all of us to uh, to want to experience that sense of belonging because the absence of it is quite painful. Now, and reading your book, I agree 100%. You make so much sense with it and just the, the way we would all react. But I remember when I was 
looking for, you know, hiring people, et cetera. At first, if someone said, oh, I know someone who's really good, oh, okay, bring them in, we'll, you know, interview them. But then the question would always come up, well, are these two people going to be too close as friends or is this a good thing? So my question to you is, do friends at work, is that a benefit to the company or is, does it become a distraction? Well, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> it depends on... You're a politician. I, I see on, that. <laughs> I know, right? I should be running for... Uh, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but it, there's some truth to it. I mean, ultimately, what we've learned uh, over, I'd say, the last 20 years is that when we have friends at work, and, th- and those relationships may end once we leave the office, right? But when we believe we have friends at work, it actually helps us feel like we are, we've got someone to go through the struggles with. We've got somebody that we can celebrate the successes with. And that actually helps us feel like we're connected to the, to the work that we're doing. Where friends at work might become you know, maybe a detriment is when it goes unchecked. And what I mean by that is, yes, we're all hired to do a job, right? And yes, we're all hired with the expectation that, hey, you're going to work alongside others, whether you like them or not. If we let friends override, or if we let friendships at work override the need for progress and and company goals, personal goals, team goals, then that's when it becomes uh, dysfunctional because friendships then become, can become catty as we've seen. We've seen, you know, kind of, I say this with air quotes, warring factions of groups of people that are very clicky. That kind of behavior is not going to help this sense of belonging. What does help the sense of belonging are those friendships that, one, provide you know, personal value to employees. However, they're rooted in the realities that that team has got to perform. And that's what we studied, and that's what we saw, is that, wow, these teams, uh, you know, so for example, Canlis Restaurant, which is a, a Michelin star restaurant up in Seattle, when we were in there observing employees, uh, you know, and when you go to a restaurant where it's a Michelin star restaurant, you're getting stellar, not just stellar food, but stellar uh, service. They work their tails off to deliver exceptional service every night they're there. And then they also play hard together after working really hard. That's where those friendships become really powerful. And that's where we saw this sense of belonging become really motivating, not just from a personal reasons, but also benefiting what the team is needing to do each each day, month, year. To get our audience interested, when we began the show, I used a phrase from your book and said, you're going to present us with the secret sauce to success. And you actually use that term. I think it's on page four or five in your book. What is the secret sauce to success? The secret sauce to success is to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm good at so that. I'd be the most successful person around. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Naps are very helpful. No, it's human chemistry, right? So, you know, when I was writing the book, I actually found some really old research that went back and called us, uh, called managers, uh, human alchemists. Um, and then I even found some quotes from the Rolling Stones around how human alchemy is really important to their ability to write and make music. Human chemistry is this, and there's actually science now that shows that when we are bonding with others, uh, our brain is releasing oxytocin, which is a neuropeptide that promotes bonding between people. But the, from, a, from a business perspective, we just couch this in leadership. And what we say is, if you are a human chemist, you are a leader. And all the things that we've discussed over the course of time around what makes a great leader helps this human chemistry actually become something of a reality rather than just something that I've written in my book. Um, you know, human chemistry is our ability to know how to work together. You know, Bill, I know where your strengths are. You know where my weaknesses are. And we help each other kind of balance those out when we're working together. And we do that when there's a sense of belonging almost intuitively because we have this awareness of how we work together as a team. And that human chemistry is part of that 
input to being able to know how to work, how to pick up where I might drop the ball or how to tap into your strength so that we can, you know, maybe get that product to market faster because you're really good at marketing, say, for example. And that's very true. I mean, when I review a book, I ask myself, does this really make sense? And if putting myself in the position um, that's talked about in the book, would I really like a place better? Well, yes. If, if I enjoy going to work, if there's a chemistry with the other people there, as opposed to a disagreement and saying she always hated me and she still hates me, etc. I, I certainly have a, a better attitude going to work. I look forward to it. And I want to stay later if, if that's what the job is going to require. Sean, at this point in the show, I yeah. just want our audience to know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Sean Murphy. His book is Work Tribes, and that's what he's telling you about and explaining human chemistry. Sean, can you tell us where the book is available and if there's a website where we can go to? Sure, sure. So the book is available anywhere books are sold, uh, Amazon, the bookstore. Uh, you can get it on if you maybe don't like to read the physical book. Obviously, there's a digital copies out there. You could also get it on Audible. Um, if you're curious about it, you want to, want to kick the tires uh, and see if this is a topic that you're interested in, uh, I encourage you to go to readworktribes.com. There you'll be able to download a free chapter as well as uh, some different tools that might help you look at how can you bring belonging to your team and ultimately to your organization. And I urge our audience to do that. I always find that if I pick up a book and I start reading some of them instantly, it's a connection like this is a book I want. I, I'm learning right away from it. I like the author's style and maybe not. But if you get that free chapter, why not take a look at it? If you like what you're reading, then you go get hold of the book Work Tribes by our guest, Sean Murphy. Sean, most people today, from what I read in your book, about 66 percent, two thirds of workers say they're disengaged. And I guess for our audience, that means they're really not into it at work. They're there in body. But the mental part is, is am I saying it correctly? They're not all in. Yeah. So disengagement basically means I just, you know, I'm I'm you know, tongue in cheek. I say retired in place. Right. You know, I show up. I don't really do anything more than what I'm asked. I don't volunteer for anything. I am, you know, you're going to have to get more out of me by, you know, telling me what to do. You know, there's disengaged, disengagement is actually a pretty serious issue that has kind of uh, baffled uh, leaders and companies for some time now. Now, it's not, I mean, a lot of times we think, okay, if we want to get the employees to put in a little more effort, let's put in a ping pong table, maybe a basketball court outside, <laughs> free lunch on Fridays, or we'll bring pizza in the last day of the month or bagels the first day of the month. But you've explained in the book, it's not just that, it's much more. Am I reading yeah, it correctly? You are. Those are what I call culture tricks, right? So, you know, I so I work in Silicon Valley, and so it's it's very in vogue to have all of those perks that you talked about. But what we know about human motivation is those perks influence motivation for a very short period of time, because other more meaningful influences on performance start to surface or not. So, for example, you know, if I have all these great perks, you know, I've got you know, kegs of beer in the break room that I can, you know, pour myself a beer at four o'clock if I want. If I'm not doing work that's meaningful or if I really don't like, if I don't feel like I belong or if I am, you know, just feeling like I'm in the cog in my boss's agenda, those nice culture tricks, well, they're just not going to really have a lasting influence on, on my performance. But what will is am I doing work that's meaningful to me? Am I doing work that I feel like is having an impact? And whatever that means to the employee. Um, and then I would also add the sense of belonging, where these friendships are really important to me being successful, to the team being successful, um, and also feeling like I have a place on a team. Those are way more motivating than the ping pong tournament that might be happening on the first Friday of every month. 
And I think we're all like that. We want to know we made the team, but also there's just making it because the coach takes everybody isn't quite the same as when you make the team, meaning you it's a real achievement because some people didn't make it and you qualified and you're really an asset to the team in the game or in the business world, whatever um, arena you're uh, competing in. Now, you talked about belonging. Is that the same as fitting in? No, no. And so, you know, to be you know, in full disclosure, the, the distinction between belonging and fitting in is something that came from Dr. Brene Brown's work. Um, and your listeners probably are very familiar with her. She's quite the celebrity um, and delightful human being. Here's what fitting in is. Fitting in is me showing up to work and deciding that the way I'm dressing might might raise an eyebrow or two. Maybe it's because I'm I like to wear black hoodies and everybody else here wears white. So I'm going to wear my white hoodie because well, I don't want to stand out from anybody else. The worry about fitting in or standing out is often connected at least in the workplace to not feeling safe, right? So fitting in is Bottom line, I have to alter who I am, how I am, in order to do my job here. Whereas belonging, it's not so much about you know you compromising who you are and your beliefs, because who my, who I am and the things that I bring to the table, my experiences, my skills, those all shape how I do my work. And in high performing teams, high performing companies, I can actually share with a, a, a relative amount or you know, feeling that it's safe for me to maybe share an idea that might be different or maybe disagree with my boss and not and, and believe that I'm not going to be retaliated against afterwards or even, you know, in the middle of the meeting. So fitting in is you know, curbing your ideas and the way you contribute because you don't want to stand out. Belonging says, hey, those are all important. We need your ideas. We need your diverse ways of thinking. We need you to be able to challenge how things are because that's how we're going to be better. So that's that's the main distinction. And fitting in is actually, it, it can become quite toxic. Now, even for the old school boys who might say, you know, he or she says, uh, look, I pay them. I give them health benefits. They get one day off a month or holidays off. They're supposed to be working. But there's a real list of benefits and advantages when you follow this philosophy. And can you tell us, I think you have five of them in the list that you have in your book. Can you go through those with us and, uh, I guess, convince that old school boss why they should become new school? Yeah, well, let me just say, can I just be real blunt? Sure. And then then also give a more kind of diplomatic answer. (laughs) Okay. I know plenty of managers out there who might say, hey, your paycheck is my grat- is gratitude enough. Well, the reality is what employees want today is not to have a boss like that. So if you're a boss like that, you're not going to have high performers very long because they're not going to tolerate that kind of mentality. Or what you're going to have is compliance from employees where you're going to be spending a lot of time getting them to do something because, well, they're unhappy, but they're not leaving. So it's it's a leadership style that really has no um, no place in what the workforce is looking for today. And, and got to keep in mind, it's a numbers game. The biggest group, the biggest group that's working in the workplace today are millennials, and millennials want to have a work experience that's positive. So that being said, the advantages of really looking at, you know, why should we be looking at belonging? One is, as we've been talking about, you know, Canlis Restaurant, they're a Michelin star restaurant. They deliver exceptional service every single night, and it's because their teams work together, they feel like they belong, and as a consequence of that, they don't get caught up in the pettiness of the, the, the you know drama between people. Sure, it happens, but it's more of a blip rather than it's the focus. So advantage one is I get to perform better, and as a consequence, the, the organization performs better when we have this sense of belonging in the culture. We talked about motivation. This is the second one. When I feel like, hey, 
people have my back. You know, the work that I do and the skills that I have, they're valued. You know, the way that my team welcomes me really make, makes me want to commit and do greater and better work. Um, that is belonging helps fuel and sustain motivation, which motivation for human beings it's it's it it's, it lingers and then it goes away, right? And then it comes back and then it goes away. So it's definitely something that we have to understand that we can't be motivated all the time. Belonging helps with that. Um, you know, one of the things that we looked at is what happens when there isn't belonging, and what happens with that is my well-being or employees' well-being takes a hit. You know, whether there might be bullying going on or uh, clicks that uh, make it really difficult to to find that belonging, those those type of influences on my day-to-day -day experience of work affect my well-being. Belonging can actually help improve employee well-being because I feel good. I feel like I've got you know, I've got my tribe, if you will, that I can connect with and bond with. The others that we've talked about, one is your know, work becomes more fulfilling because I'm doing it with people that I, that I respect, that I enjoy working alongside, and I want to do a, a good job for them as much as for myself. And then the last one is, you know, belonging helps teams become more cohesive. Um, and, you know, anybody who's leading teams – um, I was just coaching someone not too long ago on this, that when you've got an underperformer, that takes a lot of your time as a boss because you're having to manage that underperformance. But when you've got cohesion, it frees you up as a manager to focus less on what's wrong and what's not working. And, and you're able to just let the team do what it needs to do. Obviously, you're still involved. But that t cohesive team really becomes it's it's like it's a, its own engine. It helps fuel that team that team's performance. Sean, once again, I want to let our audience know that if you're just tuning in, you're listening to the Secrets of Success on the Voice of Nassau Community College, ninety point three WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Today, we're talking to Sean Murphy. He's the author of the book Work Tribes, and we're going to ask him to please give the location where we can get the book and a website where we can find out more and maybe read that free chapter. Yeah. So if you want to read that free chapter, uh, read worktribes.com there, you'll be able to download the free chapter and there's some cool tools there for you to, to kind of explore the ideas that are in the book. And of course the book is anywhere books are sold, Amazon bookstores, and you can get it. You know, I, I am still an old fashioned guy that I like the physical book, but if you like the digital book or the audio audible versions, those are available too. And also we let our audience know that if you miss part of the show or you want your boss or a coworker to hear it, you can go to nccradio.org. That's nccradio.org. Just look for Secrets of Success. The title of the show is Work Tribes. The guest is Sean Murphy. And you can listen to a podcast of the show. It's free. There's no cost. You just go to it. And you can hit the high points. You can take notes on it. Or, again, you can pass the recommendation along to a friend, a boss, an employer, employee that might be interested in this topic. One of the things, Sean, I noted in your book, and just from the employee's point of view, that People uh, who have high-quality social connections, meaning just what you said, they're belonging at work, they're less likely to be obese, they're less likely to smoke, to have high blood pressure, they have lower mortality rates, and uh, along with that, obviously, an increased life expectancy. So from the employee's mm -hmm. um, angle, these are all things that literally you can't pay for because if your health isn't good, all the money in the world isn't going to get it back for you. And um, I think that's something that you emphasize in your book and it certainly made my notes because as an employee, I think that's what we're, we're all looking for. Yeah. Now, you, you also you – know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just, I'll just come on real quickly on that. No, you know, we spend so much time at work and, you know, it's a third of our, our day. And when it's a major source of stress, anxiety, maybe even causes depression, maybe it's, it's affecting – your relationships, um, you know, I've I've coached uh, executives where you know they they drive their their team so hard that when their team members go home, maybe they all they talk about to their significant others how bad their day was. Well, that starts to take its toll on the quality of those relationships outside of work. So we really need to, I think, as leaders, accept the responsibility that how we motivate people or maybe 
to motivate them, it doesn't just impact them when they're at work. And when they go home, they bring those troubles at home back to work. There is no magic absolving employees of their problems outside of work. It's like we used to think that just it's just our brains don't work that way. And I guess while we think we're all being more professional, more polite, getting along, getting advanced degrees, you actually say that incivility at work, the opposite of what you're promoting, incivility, is actually increasing. Did did I get that out of the notes correctly? Uh, yeah, you know, we I think some of it is linked to just uh, kind of a, a general malay that seemingly is lingering in, in corporate America and even, you know, you know maybe non-corporate work environments where there's just the, the, the expectations are higher, the amount of resources, people, time, and money are less, and it's making things more difficult. And so, sure, we're going to see incivility happen, which is really just rude or unacceptable speech or behavior, right? And I don't know about you. I see it everywhere, not just here at work. Um, you know, I live in San Francisco, so I see a lot of incivil behavior towards one another. And it's just, you know, it's, it's even what we'd call common courtesy, workplace. I guess, in many instances where someone will cut, oh, yeah. cut, cut you out of a parking space or uh, do certain things that, again, would probably come under what our mom and dad and grandparents would say common courtesy. Uh, we're missing on that. So that, I think, even enhances uh, why we should be reading your book, et cetera. I also noticed, though, you, you mentioned there that employees want meaningful moments at work. Can you tell us what a meaningful moment is? Yeah, so it's so what's interesting about belonging, uh, meaningful moments, um, or what I wrote about in my first book, Optimistic Workplace, is it's very subjective. Right. So what is meaningful for me might be different for you. And the, the, the hard part that that presents or the challenge that presents for leaders is, you know, Bill, your what makes them, something meaningful for you. I've got to understand what that is. And then, you know, you have to understand what that is for me if we're going to have those moments that encourage us, that motivate us. Um, and it's it's really if you want to just strip away all of this fancy language, it's hey, you've got a relationship with your employees, with your colleagues. How do you make it an extraordinary relationship that helps get work done and do it in a way that you feel great about how you're contributing? And at the end of the day, you might be exhausted because it was a heck of a day, but you went, you know what? I've got people that I love working with. We respect each other. We have, we like hanging out with one another. That's that's at the core of all of this, right? You move, you know, take away the the language of belonging or you know uh, meaningful moments. Those are all great. You just but described life at WHPC. That's just the way it is here. <laughs> so we thank you, Sean Murphy. Thanks so much for being with us. Sean is the author of the book Work Tribes. Once again, give us that website. Uh, Read dot com. Thanks again for being with us today. We'd like our audience to know that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.